All right, again, Kyle Caldo, a little bit about me. Went to Concordia, University of Nebraska. Graduated 2011 with a degree in business administration, concentration in finance. Out of the school, worked for Emeritus, selling insurance investments. Found out I didn't like selling them, I just like talking about them. So I started teaching Dave Ramsey's class. Uh, Dave has done a lot for me in my life, and I'll share a little bit about that with you. And we'll uh, talk a little about, about what Dave what Dave teaches. Who knows? Everyone heard Dave Ramsey. Yes. What? Everyone has an opinion on Dave Ramsey. What are some things people have heard? Or the, the common sentence the out here. The envelopes. the envelopes. One thing I always hear is Dave's, Dave Ramsey's great, but I hear that all the time. Everyone has their own thing that they don't agree with Dave Ramsey. He does, he does teach very black and white. He doesn't allow for gray areas. As humans, we love gray areas. So black and white, this is how you do it. I'm a millionaire, look, this is how I got here. You're going to follow a millionaire, you're going to follow someone. Best practices, and Dave, I'll show the clip and talk a little bit about that. About find what the rich people are doing and do that. Uh, I'm married, married back in 2012, and I'm expecting a child April 30th. Because of Dave, everything's good, and I'll explain my story now. So married, 2012, I, we both went to Concordia University, Nebraska. I was blessed with a grandfather who set up a college fund for me. I graduated about 3500 in debt, and my wife wasn't so lucky, but she was still able to get out, graduate at least, but she got out with about 30000 So right away we had 33500 in debt. Uh, okay, right? So 30000 is actually about the average student loan debt out there, which is one other problem itself. Got married June of, July of 2012. July, not June, I should know that. I don't tell my wife. <laughs> it's on film. Oh, right, no. Uh, and two months later, I left that job at Emeritus. And I was unemployed for six months. And when I left, she didn't have a job. So we didn't have a job. We had all this debt. On top of that, I had a, about a $5,000 car loan. So we're looking at you know $37,000 in debt. OK, this is not good. Let's get a job. Couldn't find a job. Couldn't find a job. OK, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get a job. Started working at Nell Metz initially as a collector on the phones. And we're there. And she didn't end up getting a job. She's a teacher. She taught at a parochial school. So we're looking at a, two people with a, a collector and a school teacher. In other words, we've got we to get this together. We've got to get our finances in, in, in line. Um, right before I got that job, though, tax bill hit. That was another $5,000. Things were going bad. But let's get into the story. Since then, we have paid off all but, but I think about $12,000 in debt left, and we're actually on pace to actually just crush that in like the next three months due to savings. We had to buy a house because of the baby. I didn't follow Dave's steps exactly. Follow him, he's a millionaire, I'm not, I don't know. But uh, things are very well, and without Dave, we would have had a lot of finance fights. We had zero. We have never had a fight about money because we've been on the same page. So Dave Ramsey does great things. He teaches great philosophy, very black and white. He'll tell you what to do, what not to do. And uh, we'll get, get, about, get for that. So I'm going to show what I did to crush that debt. First, we're going to watch a little clip about myths about debt. There's a lot of myths that we've been marketed to about different kinds of debt. And Dave does a great job of going through this. He's very funny. I'm a very funny guy when he's talking. He's very easy to listen to, as you will see. If you have any questions at all, except maybe during the video, I should have said this at the beginning, just feel free to pop up your hand and answer them. Does anyone have any questions? Right now. All right. We'll go ahead and watch this, and then we'll Look at some of the, what I call, many myths, some of the segmented myths all through our culture that people believe that you have to have that to survive. Let's look at that for a second. Myth. You need a credit card to rent a car or to make purchases online. How many of you know that's false? Raise your hand. 
You know that you can do both of those things with a debit card. A debit card will do all of that. I don't carry any credit cards, and I haven't for 20 years. I have two pieces of plastic of that type in my pocket, in the front pocket that I carry my, my driver's license in there, and I've got a debit card on my personal account and a debit card on my business, and that's it. And I travel more than any two of you put together. I'm all over the place, international and everything. So this idea that you have to have a credit card to somehow exist on this planet is marketing to the point that you believed it. It's mythology. Myth. I pay mine off every month with no annual fee. I get brownie points, air miles, and a free hat. Truth. Over 100 million Americans do not pay their balance off every month. And according to USA Today, 63% of the people that file bankruptcy, which is most of them, said the reason they filed bankruptcy was credit card debt. That was their breakdown. That was their problem. And here's the deal. When you spend with plastic, you don't feel it. When you spend with cash, you feel it. You have an ouchy moment when you do that. I mean, think, think about it. If you get Uncle Benjamin Franklin and you carry him around a little while, and you get your little stack of Uncle Ben's $100 bills, eventually Uncle Ben becomes like part of the family. <laughs> Uncle Ben. <laughs> and then you get ready to buy something with this puppy, you're going to feel it like we talked about the, in the last lesson. You're going to feel it. I want you to learn to feel money again. And you'll feel pain if you carry Uncle Ben around. Because then when you get ready to buy something, it's not like you're buying something. It's like you're putting a family member out for adoption. I mean, think about it. That black tray comes at the restaurant with the bill in it. That's like Uncle Ben's coffin. Bye, Ben. Because you know he's leaving and you're not going to see him again. He's not coming back. You have a moment. But when, when you pay with plastic, you don't feel it. McDonald's found this. That's why they were the first fast food restaurant to go to taking plastic several years ago. Any of you old enough to remember before fast food took plastic? Now, the reason was McDonald's did a focus group study. They're excellent marketers. They did a great job. And with their focus group study, they found that the average person using plastic spends 47% more than the person who pays cash. So here's what happens in a quick serve restaurant, a fast food restaurant. You walk in with this, and you're going, oh, yeah, I'll supersize that. I'll have the apple pie, and I'll pay for his. You walk in there with this, you're like, a oh, dollar menu, you're on your own. <laughs> you have a moment right here with this, don't you? And, and well, Dave, I, I get all these benefits. I get airline miles. 75% so of the airline miles are never redeemed. Besides that, here's the deal. I've met with thousands of millionaires. I've never met a millionaire that said, Dave, you know, made all my money with airline miles. <laughs> that was my breakthrough. My financial breakthrough was my Discover Points. Yeah, you know those reward cards? That, that's what that's what put me in. I got, I got free airline tickets and boom, I'm a millionaire, just like that. Instead, what happens is you spend more and you spend more and you spend more and you spend more because you're not feeling it money anymore. And you've lost the idea that personal finance is 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. MIT did a study that was printed in Carnegie Mellon magazine. And what they came up with was this. They discovered with an MRI study that when you spend cash, it activates the pain centers of the brain. And when you spend with plastic, it does not activate the brain. As a matter of fact, they found several cases where there was no brain. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so spending with plastic costs you more because you're going to spend more, obviously, and you're going to go into debt and you're not going to pay it off because 100 million people did not pay their balances off. Everybody says they did, but it's like this cultural, you even lie to yourself. Like, that. well, there was that one time and then there was that other time and then there was that other time. When you really go back through your records, you'll find that they've tagged you with several fees and several interest rates along the way, even those of you that are quote unquote disciplined. I use my credit cards wisely and I take advantage of this multi-billion dollar company who does extreme levels of studies on my behavior. I've got it figured out. I'm going to beat them up. See, that just doesn't work. You're losing this battle. That's why their building is bigger than your house. 
myth. I'll make sure my teenager gets a credit card so he or she can learn to be responsible with money. Oh, goody! Let's go ahead and make sure that we put the curse on the whole family tree. Make sure the rest of the, the rest of the family's broke like we are. This is a dumb idea. This is not working. Truth. Teens are a huge target of credit card companies today. And it's had an effect even in colleges. Colleges all across America are experiencing a dropout rate. And see, when I think of people dropping out of college, I think of people dropping out of college because they didn't make the grades. But the truth is the number one reason people are dropping out of college right now, debt, credit card debt and financial trouble is the number one reason people are leaving college. The first company that gives you a credit card, you have tremendous brand loyalty with them. I'll, I'll, I'll be doing an event, maybe at a book signing or something, chopping up credit cards, and I'll have someone come up and I'll cut up five, six, seven, one lady, 17, whatever credit cards, right? And I'll be chopping them up, and, and then I'll look at them and I'll go, where's the other one? Well, well, I've had this one since college. So, see, see the emotional tie to that? See how people, don't, don't you wish you ran a company that did a great job of marketing like that? Where people would be defensive and emotional to retain the use of your product. Wow, that is excellent marketing. And they've gone far beyond now, far beyond marketing your teenagers. Now they're doing a, an immoral form of marketing, I call it, called kitty branding. Now, kitty branding is when you teach little children how you want them to think so that later they use your product. And I, I really think this is just improper, and a lot of consumer advocates agree with me, and, and many of us have gone after some of these companies. But it, it's out of control. You remember the, the whole ad campaign Visa had out? Life takes Visa. You remember that ad campaign? Did, did you know that now the game of life no longer has money in it. It has only a visa in it. So when your kid plays the game of life, are you hearing the message? To win at the game of life, you need visa. This is your 10-year-old, 12-year-old's message. And they hear this over and over and over again. So it's no wonder when they go on the college campus the first time, some bozo standing there handing out free t-shirts, they sign up because after all, life takes visa. And of course, Barbie, Barbie's gone crazy on credit cards. I love Barbie. She's awesome. I'm not mad at Barbie. Our girls have Barbie. We got Barbie parts all over the house, right? But Barbie's got her own little shopping spree and Barbie Fashion Fever, all these different Barbie products, and they all have credit cards in them. The commercial for this one right here, the little girl swiping it, she goes, it's so good. I never run out of money. This is the message that's being sent to your five-year-old girl, your four-year-old girl, learning how to handle money. And the worst one all that just broke my heart was when I found the new Monopoly electronic banking version. There's no money! How can you have Monopoly without money? Say it isn't so! Next thing you know, they'll be emailing you the deed. <laughs> started with this product several years ago. This was one of the first ones. This is Cool Shopping Barbie from the 90s. Cool Shopping Barbie was sponsored by MasterCard. They gave Mattel a ton of money. It came complete with a full-size MasterCard and a little MasterCard taped to her pretty little hand. And again, we're not mad at Barbie. We wish she'd eat a little better, but we're not mad at her. <laughs> so, I mean, it's unbelievable. So here's what happens when your kid scans out. There's no cash that came with this, right? This is how you go shopping. Mommy goes shopping. This is how I'm going to go shopping. And we're playing shopping, right? And this is being drilled in the kid's head, right? And here's what your little kid hears over. And number one, they're holding a MasterCard. They're not holding a Discover card. They're not holding a Visa. MasterCard is drilled into their psyche, right? This is just wrong, people. And, and, and here's what happens when she scans out. Listen to this. Credit approved, you airhead. <laughs> well, let's deal with some big boy and big girl toys. How about car payments? Myth, car payments are a way of life. You'll always have a car payment. How many of you ever heard that one? 
I've heard that myth most of my life. And it usually, no one says it with enthusiasm, like, hey, car payments are way like You're always going to have a car payment. No, they're always kind of whining, you know what I'm saying? It's like, car payments are a way of life. You're always going to have a car payment. The little man can't get ahead. The little man hadn't got a shot. Isn't it ridiculous? And this victim mentality, rather than this idea that I get to make choices that affect my future and affect my destiny and give me the power to change my family tree. And it all goes back to that whole thing. I'm going to surrender and I'm going to work for the company store my whole life. I'm going to be a rat in a wheel. Run, 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 run. All the money comes in. All the money goes out. Only the names are changed to protect the innocent. The truth is, is the typical millionaire stays away from car payments by driving reliable used cars. That's how they became a millionaire. The average car payment in North America today is $492 over 63 months, according to the Federal Reserve. Now think about this. We talked about this in super savings. We saw compound interest. Let's take $492 and invest it instead of putting it in a car payment. From age 30 to age 70, it's $5.8 million. I hope you like the car. It's unbelievable. The amount of money that costs you to drive that car payment over and over and over. When instead, what Grandma would do is she'd take that $492, use common sense, and save up to buy something, wouldn't she? $492 into a cookie jar for 10 months, 10 times 492 is $4,920, $5,000. I can take $5,000 and go out of state highway that way or that way or that way, and within a few hours, I'll find me a little Honda Accord or a Ford Taurus or a Chevy Cavalier or something like that for four or $5,000 that'll get me back and forth to work without a car payment. Now, if I then, since I don't have a car payment, save a car payment again for 10 more months, now I've got another $5,000. Can I put $5,000 with a $5,000 car I just bought and get me a $10,000 car? Say yes. Could I do it one more time? That'd be 10 more months. That'd be a $15,000 car. That's 30 months, two and a half years. But we want it, and we want it right now. Don't you dare tell me I can't have what I want. And the number one answer on my radio show when people call the Dave Ramsey Show and they're in trouble and they're wanting help with something, the number one answer has become sell a car. One of them called up. <laughs> He's like, Dave, I, I got this issue and I'm having trouble paying my payments. And I said, well, how much do you owe on your car? I don't have a car payment. You don't have a car payment. How much do you owe on your truck? <laughs> oh, ha, 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 ha. Oh, really? How much do you have? $41,000. On your truck? Yeah. How much is your truck payment? $763. What? How much is your house payment? Dave, we live in a double wide. It's $551. Dude, if your truck payment is bigger than your house payment, you might be a redneck. <laughs> basis for your financial troubles. Seriously, sell the car, sell the car, sell the car. It's so bad, we were in Indianapolis, Indiana doing an event a while back with about 6,000 people out there, and a guy came up at the break and handed me the Indiana Auto and RV Trader Magazine. You know the Trader Magazine you can get in your neighborhood with the pictures of the cars that are for sale, and it's free or it's a dollar or something, you can post your car in there for sale. On the front cover is a 2000 Dodge Ram 3500. $34,900, Dave Ramsey says sell. <laughs> now, I'm not against you having a nice car. I want you to have a nice car. I just don't want your nice car to have you. I don't want it to own your future. I don't want it to own your children's future. I want you to drive like no one else, so later, you can drive like no one else. And we need to clear something up, too. Some of you people are sending me emails with pictures of your hoopies. Your old beat up, broken down car that you're driving while you get out of that, smoke coming out the back. I'm with you on that. That's what I did. I drove like no one else so that later I can drive like no one else. But please, don't send me an email and say, that's your Dave's car. Your really nice car when you get out of debt and get wealthy. That's the same car. (laughs) 
All right, so that's just a little bit of a teaser. He goes on to talk about other forms of debt and other myths out there. Uh, who's heard of his, his base teaching goes on seven baby steps, he calls them. Who's heard of those? Does anyone know them off the top of their head? Yeah. Emergency, emergency fund. So yes, so ba baby step, I'll go through the baby steps here real quick. First baby step that Dave teaches, $1,000 in the bank. And what's that $1,000 for? Emergencies. Emergencies, yes. Basically, tire was fine. Need a new tire. Uh, not need a new shirt. Not need a new down payment, partial down payment on a car. No. That's only for emergencies. Does anyone know step two? That's snowball. That's snowball. They have all debts. Oh boy. They have all debts, and we'll go through the debt snowball here at the very end. It's a very brilliant way to pay off your debt. It's not rocket science. It works, and it keeps you motivated. So we'll sketch out the last minute clip here. Um, anyone know step three? Save for retirement. Get in there. Three to six months. Three to six months, correct. So you need to save three to six months. For emergencies, essentially, this is your full, fully funded emergency bucket. This is not money to play with. This is boring money. Dave talks about how guys hate this money. You know, girls love. He talks about the difference of guys and girls. How girls need it for security. He does a good job of being able to relate to everybody. So, we have three to six months savings. Maybe step four: retirement. Invest fifteen. He says fifteen percent into tax-favored retirement funds. And I heard Sarah was talking about 401k uh, orientation. orientation. 401k, absolutely great. Match, did this mean very much? Match, free money, boom! I love it, I love it, okay, sorry. I really do enjoy the match. So no wrap? Yeah, basically what Dave will say is fund your 401k up until the match. So if, that's, if that takes all 15%, that all goes in. If it takes, if they match three percent, you put three percent there. Everything else, they'll save to a Roth. But if you have the option of doing a Roth, four hundred one k. Well, that's what that's what I do with Roth four hundred one k. He loves the Roth. Care. Well, yeah, exactly. Right. He, he, he loves the Roth. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Step five. And this is a lot of people backwards on their list. Step five is saving for kids. Education, college. There's a very simple way reason why this is ahead of this. Does anyone know what that reason would be? If you have to, you can't. You, you can't, can't take, a take a loan out for retirement. If you get there and you can't retire, guess what? You're just gonna work and work and work. After a lifetime of working? No. We do not want that. We want it. It doesn't order. That's why Dave has it at number five. You have to take care of yourself first. You might sound selfish. You might want to help out, but if you're not in the spot, you only want to take care of yourself first. Kids can make it through college. Not the best. You see the ones want to avoid them, but they can do it at least. So that's why you have a head of college education. Step six. Notice step four is actually all non-mortgage debt. So step six is pay off. That mortgage. Step seven is to build wealth and give. Enjoy being philanthropic, being generous with your money. You've been, you've, you've won the race. Time to go have fun. And that's the that's the exciting <laughs> part that we all want to get to. Be wealthy. That's where we're. That's why we be so intentional. That's why they said it's finances are eighty percent. Behavior, 20% brain knowledge. You don't need to know how, the, how everything works. You just need to be intentional with what you're doing and don't let anyone get in your way. Uh, any questions on those seven? What was the thousand again? Just $8,000? $1,000 savings. Okay. Many people are already, already step one done. Step <coughs> one. Uh, I know one of Dave's 
And I said, everyone has a Dave, I love Dave Ramsey, but. The one thing I don't hear with but is this, this, this death snowball. People won't say, Dave Ramsey's great, but how to get out of debt, that is not the way to do it. No, people will say, that is a great way to get out of debt. A lot of times, obviously, Dave does not like credit cards. That's a big one. People say, you know, I love Dave Ramsey, but I do love my rewards miles. Or, but, but, I'm uh, <coughs> that a lot. So, let's get into that death snowball. Exactly what is it? Does anyone know what this death snowball is? Yes? Yes. yes. Uh, I guess, does it go with paying the highest interest rate off first or the smallest balance first? Dave will go with smallest balance, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just jump to this clip here in a second. But basically, it makes the least sense financially. But because it makes the least sense financially, it doesn't, remember, 20% mm -hmm. head knowledge, 80% behavior. The 80% of behavior of paying off that smaller balance, getting that feeling of accomplishment, moving forward. Hey, I had 10 debts, I have nine. I just got rid of one tenth of my loans. Let's keep going. It's the mentality of you gotta keep, you gotta drill through, you gotta have intensity, do it with passion. Otherwise, if you you don't want to get burned out, and that's one way. If you have a high interest rate and it's your biggest loan, you might get burned out and ah, this isn't worth it, it's too hard. I know we're with uh, fitness, same way. One people people say with money, what's the least amount that I can do and be extremely wealthy? That's the worst question possibly. Same thing with getting fit. What's the least amount of exercise I can do and have a six pack? What? <laughs> That's not how it works. So it's the same, same, same way. So we'll get to this. Uh, watch the clip on. with selling stuff, everywhere we can get money from, we're going to start throwing it at these debts in baby step two. Now, baby step two is pay off all of your debt except your home using the debt snowball. Now, the debt snowball form looks like this. You list your debts smallest to largest. You pay minimum payments on everything but the little one. And you squeeze every dollar out of any part of your life you can at, at baby step two. And you're throwing it at that smallest debt. We're not investing yet. We're not doing any savings at this point. We're gazelle intense attacking the debt as hard as we can go, as fast as we can go. Now, and so this, this is Joe and Susie's death snowball. The first thing they do is they pay off the $50 bill to diagnostic. I don't know who diagnostic is, but if you drive near a hospital, you have to pay them 50 bucks. <laughs> so, the minimum payment on that is $10. They pay it off doing a garage sale, so they don't have that $10 anymore. So when they get to the $460 hospital bill, they, it's $38. They take the $10 and the $38, which means they're now paying at least $48 on that. Every time the snowball rolls over, it picks up more snow. When you pay off number one, you take the payment from there and put it on number two. When you pay off number two, you take the payment from there and put it on number three. And so every time it picks up more snow. When we pay off Home Depot or start paying on Home Depot $770, that's a $45 payment, but we freed up $48, so now we're putting $93 on the debt. Now when we get down to Chase Visa, we got $3,300 over there. We're going to take the $93 and add it to the $150, which is the normal payment. Now we're paying $243 on Chase Visa. When we pay that off, we got that $243 plus the $310 car payment on the $6,400 car loan. So now we're paying $553 on that. So every time this thing rolls over, it picks up more snow. Every time you pay off the debt, you got more money to pay on the next debt down. Plus, we're squeezing every dollar out of work. We're squeezing extra work, we're squeezing every dollar out of selling stuff, and we're throwing all of it at the debt snowball. Here's what happens. Again, this is behavior based. The first time you pay off that little debt, you go, well, that's interesting. Then you pay off another one, you go, hmm, it's pretty cool. Then you pay off another one, you're like, this might work. Then you pay off another one, you're like, hey, baby, get in here, look at this. This is gonna work. And by the time you get to the bottom, you're totally in gazelle mode because you're believing it's gonna happen for you. You get fired up because you start to see it. We, we're getting traction in our finances for the first time in our adult lives. Ah! I mean, you are ready to attack them because you're winning. When you win, it adds momentum 
to the program. It adds momentum to your behavior change. It adds momentum to your life. And that's what we desperately need in our finances. We've had negative momentum culturally for so long where our money is going to other people. And it's time for that to stop. It's past time for that to stop. Now, if you want to go online at DaveRamsey.com, you'll find more myths there that are covered. If you want to look at some of the other things, you what about this debt or what about that kind of debt, I destroy them all. They're all destroyed. So you can watch the rest of them there if you'd like. And if you're in here and you're struggling financially, always go watch that Credit Sharks in Suits lesson online. It'll tell you how to deal with the collectors and how to properly go through and put together a plan. If you're really behind and you're really struggling, you're probably not bankrupt. You're probably just scared and don't have a plan. And I'll show you how to put together one if you're in that situation there. So, time right now for us to take and do our one-minute takeaway. What's your one or two or three takeaways that you're going to write during this one minute? Go. So it's pretty, pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Debt snowball. We're down to two. Me and my wife just paid off another one two days ago. So two left, and it feels good. Okay. Uh, now this is all great. Got the seven baby steps. Okay, Kyle, I'm gonna do that. But how am I going to make sure I stay in track? How do I make sure I get this done? Well, there's a word. Many people hate it. Budget. Many people hear budget, and they think, ah, oh, a box, I'm stuck. A budget. Oh, someone else is going to be telling my money what to do. No, you get to create the budget. You're the one who budgets where your dollars go. Budget isn't a tool to prevent you or to hold you back. Really, a budget is a tool to get you where you want to go with purpose and do it in a way that you are in charge of. Think about any successful business. Do you think successful businesses don't budget? Of course they budget. They budget, they forecast, they do all that. Wouldn't you want, I mean, if you, again, following best practices, if rich people are budgeting and rich people Successful businesses are budgeting. Well, maybe I, maybe I should budget. You should. Dave will actually teach us, and that's probably one of the most important lessons, and that gets really into the weeds of this whole thing. You should do a budget every single month. And a lot of people don't like that. But with budgeting, it gets easy. It's like riding a bike. Eventually, it's not so bad. It takes about three months. Of, well, go ahead. How does he feel about no interest financing programs? So like you can go yep. get something that you need and you have three years, 0% interest to, to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend doing that no. or not? Nope, never. There's two, there's two things. First, the principle behind that. You still owe money. <coughs> if you, even if you have no interest, you still owe money. Yeah. What's that called? Debt. I mean, that's just the principle behind it. And two, I don't remember the stat off the top of my head, but there's a stat of a large percent of people still end up paying interest. Um, Again, all these financial tools out there, could you get that 0% financing and paid off in three years? Absolutely, you could. But it's, I want to move forward. I don't, to, I don't want to have to take money, borrow money, owe money. And that's the same reason he doesn't even support credit cards every month. If you pay it off and you pay it off, and you are the one that actually paid it off without uh, paying interest, you still technically, I mean, that's what the definition of debt is, you owe someone money. That's what David said. Any other questions? Go ahead. So I'm still confused on the whole, uh, you know, you're in high school, college, whatever, and you, you need to try to establish credit for yourself. Mm -hmm. I've always heard that it's good for a younger person to get a credit card, pay it off every month, establish credit. Yep. And I didn't know any different. So yep. my parents did it for me, and yep. when I went to go buy my first car, I had good credit. Yep. Um, if he doesn't believe in that, then how do you establish credit? He says you don't. And that's you don't establish He says credit. no. He says that credit scores are again another marketing, and this is what this is big about Dave. But I like Dave, but I don't agree with him on that credit scores. What Dave says is if you, but banks do. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. There are still banks though, and I'll say this: it is easier to have a credit score. But there are banks that do manual underwriting, for especially in mortgages. That will do a manual, all right, I'll do the work, show me your income, show me your utility bills, show me all that. You don't have debt? 
oh, you have $1,000 left at the end of the month? Oh, okay, well, let's work. We can get this with you. We're not, we're not going to turn you down. I'm not saying it's the easy way. But I'm saying just the way that Dave, he just wants you to hate that so much to not even think about it with that monthly credit card. So. Do you have another question? Yeah, have question. go ahead. Um, what if you have a mortgage that's like 3% where you can invest that money and earn, I mean, is it even, let's say, no debt at all? Or with mortgage rates so low now, if you can get more off of your investment? Are you saying, well, he does have paying off the mortgage below investing the 15%. So I'm just saying, like, would he believe that? Is it better if you're locked in, let's say, at 30 year at 3% on your mortgage? Mm -hmm. Is it better to still pay that off in step six? Yeah. Or yep. invest or in the, instead money? of putting a little extra money here, just start putting on extra money there? Yes, he would. And again, it's the, that doesn't make the most sense financially, because you could. You could, I mean, you could easily outdo that 3%. Mm -hmm. But then what if you don't? Well, what if you're out of debt? That's a guarantee. Hey, I'm out of debt. Debt free is the way to be, right? I don't I want to move forward. I want to make money. The opposite of making money is going into debt. And that's that's what you that's what you would say. Any other questions? So yes, budgeting. That's where we were. Is it who here? I'm gonna ask a question. Who here has it? Who here budgets every month? Wow. Who here budgets every month and their budget isn't a, no, that looks good. They actually sit down and do the budget. Okay? It's easy to fall into that. And one thing that people say, Kyle, why? I don't want to do a budget every month. Why do I need to do a bunch of budget every month? Well, do you have any, any annual expenses such as re-registering re your car? Do you think that needs to get budgeted for? You think 100, 200 bucks, whatever it costs to register a car? <coughs> I think that needs to get budgeted for. You don't want to go out all of a sudden have my budget, my budget ready to go and then have that hit you. You've got to be intentional with that budget. You've got to do it every every month. It sounds like it sounds painful, but it's really not. It's really easy. Uh, one thing in uh, so this is obviously called Financial Peace. I don't think I even said that. Financial Peace University is the class that Dave's class and this is what this clip is from. You can, if you are interested, you can look online. Just Google Financial Peace class. You can sign up for it online. Um, but one, one thing that's really beneficial about those classes is you get together with a group of people somewhere like this, and you get to know them over nine weeks, and get to share stories and realize I'm not alone. And you get the group mentality of we're going to do this. I think the most recent class in the nine weeks that I taught, I think they took a $40,000 swing from crushing debt and building savings. So just in nine weeks, huge amounts of change can happen. Um, Dave mentioned in the video about gazelle intensity, and I wanted to talk to that. This is earlier in the video, but it's important noting. He talks about gazelle intensity because he was watching a video of, uh, of gazelles and cheetahs. The cheetah is faster than the gazelle, it's the fastest land mammal, but the gazelle wins like 18 out of 19 times. Why? Motivation. He's running for his life. You gotta be like the gazelle, debt, chasing him. Here's your credit card, here, take out a mortgage, here, ah, 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 ah. Just gotta be focused, run for your life, and that's what the gazelle intensity is really about. Another thing I like to do when I teach my classes is, we'll do this now, oh yeah, uh, is ways to save. Because Dave will talk about stuff, but he doesn't necessarily dive into absolutely everything. He talks about all like, insurance, uh, investments. He does talk about a lot, but he doesn't talk about necessarily the day-to-day -day things. <coughs> so one thing I always like to do, and I'll open this up and see if anyone has anything. What is something someone here has done and say the past month or something that they have been able to save, whether that's been, has anyone renegotiated with the cable company, their lower the cable bill, or their internet, or you have you? I did that like a couple, yeah, two months ago. Two months ago? Yeah. Did you um, did you cut in half? Yeah. Cut in half? Was, well, it was close, almost half. Almost half. Yeah. So if you cut your current cable bill in half, what would that mean? Would that mean an extra night out? 
to enjoy? Would that mean extra money to throw towards your kids' college education? Would that mean extra $12 to just lose in the wash? No, it's not. Don't lose your money in the wash. It's not a good plan. One thing I, I like, and I'll, I'll say this because this always fascinates people. My smartphone provider, has anybody heard of Ting? T-I-N-G. So Ting is a wholesaler of Sprint Towers. And they were actually just voted Consumer Reports best cell phone carrier. The reason Ting is so fabulous is it really enables, kind of follows what Dave says, you know, live like no one else so later you can live like no one else. They charge, have tiered pricing, and they charge uh, by minutes, data, and uh, texts. So if you don't use it, you know, if I were to not use my phone at all, it would only cost me $6. It's not I paid for this and I have that excess and it just disappears. It's not even I paid for this and it rolls over like some. So me and my wife, we both have smartphones and it only costs us about $40 a month. So that's a huge savings. T-I-N-G, check it out. There are pros and cons, but it's definitely a, <coughs> something I'm all for. I'm all for. Let them know one else later so I can get to step seven. So the three to six months, is that uh, three to six months worth of your income? No, or three expenses? to six months. expenses. Your expenses. Your expenses. So, so okay. whatever, whatever it takes to be able to bo lose both your job and your wife's job or no income coming in that you could live for three to six months. Got it. And then the other question is, would you recommend putting more towards retirement than putting more towards your mortgage payment? So let's say you want to pay extra towards your mortgage. Right. So if you want to pay an extra 200 bucks towards your mortgage, would he say, no, don't do that, put an extra $200 towards a Roth? He would say, well, if you pitch your 15%, <coughs> he says, stop, we've got other things to do with that money. That being one. Once, once you get here, once this is gone, he'd say, go back to start investing everything you can and start enjoying life. Does he have any suggestions on saving for kids' education before you start digging into your mortgage? Then? Since that's ahead of it on the list, or you know, uh, how much you need to save or... Well, basically, it's, he, he says, save what you can. I mean, if you get to, if you get to this point, if 15% takes up all of your main cash at the end of the month, and you have no cash left for this, I mean... You... But does he like, <coughs> like state-sponsored plans? Does he like um, mutual funds and like Aetna's? Or what, what does he like for savings vehicles for kids' education? Yeah, probably the most common would be the 529. Mm -hmm. So just whatever, find he's big, big proponent of staying in state, save a lot of money that way. <coughs> Having kids work through college, there are studies show that kids working through college get better grades when a lot of people think yeah, it's I'd the opposite. Pay for it. huh? I'd rather they pay for it. Exactly, yeah, make them pay for it anyway. Teach them a life lesson. But it, it is a blessing to have college paid for you though. I know I almost, I mean, for your private school and I'm only 3,500, I'm very blessed from what my grandfather did. So that's what I want to do, is I want to get here and we'll do that either for my grandkids or my kids if I can get there fast enough. I'll be able to get them kick started so they can repeat the process. Dave mentioned changing your family tree. You really, really can. You can do it one generation. Your generation. You can be the one to, to make that. <coughs> what does he say about insurance? Like? Which one? Well, just any. Like, I mean, when you talked about like negotiating with your cable provider, sure. how does he, what does he say about negotiating like, on insurance? I mean, we're, we pay, we're insurance heavy. I mean, a lot of us pay a lot of insurance for a lot of different things. Yep. I mean, is there things that can be eliminated or are there things that you can negotiate or? What he would say, and I'll kind of touch, he's got a whole lesson right. on insurance. Yeah. So, right. yeah. Unless you guys want to stick around for another hour and a half. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, probably one of the main things that Dave's known for, life insurance, whole life versus term. So this is, I'm very familiar with this, this is what I sold. I sold term, because I was, even back then I knew Dave, and I was like, this is no better. The insurance company said, Kyle, why aren't you selling more insurance? And I'm like, I'm selling just as many policies as the guy next door. What do you want from me? Just all the right stuff. Uh, but he would say, well, keep your insurances, your insurance, and your investments, your investments. So if there, you have any insurance policy, has cash value or any insurance policy that has some sort of investment vehicle, 
he would say, don't, don't do that anymore. He does say, though, if you have whole life insurance, you better get term before you cancel it. Otherwise, you're on your own if you get declined for insurance. Because that does happen. I uh, about to write a policy on a guy, and he didn't get qualified. He looked completely healthy. I had no idea what was wrong with him. But it happens. So. Uh, but he's all, he, yeah. I guess more with insurance, there are ways to lower your premiums. And those ways are raising a deductible, lowering the total amount paid. That's a no-no. That's what Dave would say, raise your deductible. If you get, if you get a point, you know, you get this, hey, I could handle, I could handle a $6,000 deductible if it means I'm saving $100 a month. I could, I could handle that. I, I wouldn't want to, but you never want, you never want to pay out that. But it's better than uh, paying that extra $100 if you can handle it. And he talks about how to do a cost-benefit analysis. <coughs> real simple. How, how much are you saving? How long would it take you to save that money? Versus how much you have to pay out if one accident happened. So it took you two years of saving that hundred dollars a month to get back what the deductible increase would be. Is it worth it for you for two years? Do you think you can make it two years without getting that car accident without having to pay the adventure? Because really, it is up to you. You're the one who can decide. But insurance is there to protect big, expensive. We can handle the small <coughs> stuff. It hurts, but we can handle the small stuff. HSAs have a high deductible health plan. Um, doesn't make sense necessarily for everyone, but especially if you're in relatively good health, it makes a lot of sense. Who's, who's taking this class? So you're, you're taking it right now? Just two? I read the book, Total Money Makeover? Yeah. Okay, anyone listen to his radio show? Sometimes? So yeah, he's uh, definitely knows what he's, what he's talking about. And he's obviously funny. I'm glad you guys are laughing. I laugh at a lot of stuff. So. Talk, talk a little bit about the envelopes. So envelopes. Yeah. One thing, when Dave's talking about credit cards versus cash, he says, you're using cash. He says, every month, all cash. Take envelopes. You're going to have different envelopes. One envelope for food. If you make a purchase at all in that month for food, it has to come from that envelope. If that envelope is empty, no more food. You live off of me. <laughs> of course, if it's your first month and you really didn't know what you're doing, <laughs> put hundred dollars for food for the family. Fine. That's not going to work. You got. I mean, that's the whole point of the three month of budgeting. You got to learn. Get better at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you steal money from another envelope? <laughs> I mean, technically you can. I mean, to get food. But, but, but at the end of the month, at the end of the month, the whole point is we're going to make it. At the end of the month, we're not going to be in a worse situation than it was to be made a month. We're not going to spend more than I made. And that's an envelope for, it's like extreme budgeting. budgeting. Yeah, it's cool. Like extreme couponing, like extreme budgeting. If you were to try that system, I would try just with food first. Yeah. I know food's really good, clothing's great. Um, Dave also mentions in, in a budgeting basic is have a little bit of low money. So uh, whether that's $50 a month for husband and wife, that uh, allows me to go and Buy fishing stuff that my wife doesn't think I need. But I need it! Uh, <coughs> but that's the basics of it. Makes sense? Okay. Thanks, I gotta go. No problem. See. What other questions? Topics? I'm curious about Dave. What's he saying to kids? What's, you know, what age or what, what, what's the best thing we can be teaching our kids right now? Teaching kids, one thing he would say is definitely, you know, teach them basically doing a budget right away. If they, if you do it your whole life, you're going to know nothing else. So if you have a kid, he does say it's probably better to do commissions rather than, uh, he calls it commissions, but chores. Make the budget a quarter instead of here's your $5 for a week. Teaches them that to get money, you got to work. That's how, that's how the real world is. It's, why should it be different? Growing up, and then with that, you know, I know there are. I've heard several stories from different people. Um, you can even make like 
I think it's a little harsh, but I've heard people make them pay rent. Like they'll say, here's here's hundred dollars, sixty of that's mine. Here's your so really they're only giving them forty dollars, but they get the kid gets to see it, hold it, and give it back. I mean, like I said, that's a little extreme. I don't know. Can't pay rent. But you think that kid gets the real world and he doesn't know how to pay rent? I bet you ten out of ten times that kid's gonna be spot on. How about this for a question? Anyone do anything growing up that their parents taught them as kids financially that was very I say, I do this with my kids just because that's what my parents did. It. Like birthday money or any sort of like Christmas money, you get half, you have to save half. Yes. Type of thing. So that's what I do with my kids. Get half, save half. Times, even a little bit more or something. And <laughs> they don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you did. But they'll appreciate that when it's time to. Yeah. I mean, how old are the kids? Um, 15. So yeah, I mean, when college, especially when college kids there or whatever. I know Sarah, you had your hand up. Mm -hmm. My parents, parents always, well, I grew up on a dairy farm, so I had to work a lot. And so I got money from that. And so my parents always made us put 10% towards church. And then we could either pick two-thirds or three-fourths to go into our savings. <laughs> I always picked two-thirds. <laughs> um, but it was good because then, because we couldn't use that money until we got out of college. And so we got out of college. So yeah, basically just teaching your kids those best practices right away. And there is no, I know there's a, uh, there are piggy banks out there, clear piggy banks, that would be like three sections, titled, you know, savings, spending, and giving. And you give your kid three dollar bills and says, okay, you gotta, you gotta put one in each. And they actually see, okay, this one, this one's going to saving, this is what I can spend, and they can, that's the basics of budgeting. You know, one thing I adopted for my friends when I graduated college was a lease on a car. And I remember reading, uh, when I read this book, what he called a lease, a, a fleece. fleece. <laughs> but, uh, just, uh, you know, it's just a car you're never going to own and you're going to pay rent on it. And mm -hmm. it's just a, a bad deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, not until I read his book that I started to understand some of those things. But. Yeah. And reading the book really is... Reading the book we're taking the class is the best way to go because I can tell you about it, but he had all the numbers behind it. He does a real good job of explaining it. Um, I think it's a fun one.